Boker Tov, for Toda, for the invitation to speak. And that's as much of my tourist Hebrew as I'm going to inflict on you. I don't want to ruin your uh, beautiful language. And to our Arab friends, I say, Assalamu Alaikum. So, um, I'm going to start with what I'm not going to talk about. So, in this session, it wouldn't be appropriate to talk about Neolithic uh, um, sedimentary DNA. But if you're interested, uh, with Robin Allaby and Vince Gaffney, we had a paper out uh, just a few weeks ago in, in science, which is relevant to uh, this particular symposium. So what I'm going to talk about instead is looking at uh, pathogens. And it was interesting the way Chuck presented yesterday with a series of questions of, of, and, and how things came about, the kind of historical narrative as to why you actually did what you did. And my investigations here started with this guy, David Minikin, who, when I used to work at the University of Birmingham, came up to me one day and said he had this bison bone, which he had signatures from lipids and others, uh, uh, other evidence, that it had TB in it, and could I get any TB sequences from it? And I said, well, we're not set up to do ancient DNA work. Uh, I don't want to get into doing PCRs. Uh, devising a capture-based approach would be quite tricky. But as it, uh, as it happened, I just had this paper out in the Journal of the American Medical Association where we've been using shotgun metagenomics on faecal samples from the uh, German STEC outbreak of <coughs> 2011. So I said, well, we could have a go using shotgun metagenomics. It's, uh, it's a bit of a long shot, but let's see uh, if we could try this out. But then I said, well, also, I'm a bit worried because I think it was 17,000-year-old bison bone. I thought, this is very precious material. Um, we don't want to just start practicing on that. So I said, have you got anything perhaps less precious and, and less old? Um, and he then put me in touch with Helen Donahue, who had some material that was suitable. So when we were thinking about why, you, why should we try shotgun metagenomics, uh, one of the arguments was that if we could avoid amplification and there's a risk of carryover, risk of contamination. Hybridization capture uh, is um, okay, but it's, uh, if you use metagenomics, it's kind of assumption-free. With, with hybridization, you actually have to know what you're looking for and design probes, baits, to get what you're looking for. Whereas with shotgun metagenomics, we could find perhaps the unknown unknowns to use that ugly Rumsfeldism. Um, and also, we were just being lazy, because it meant we didn't have to go and design all the primers. You just extract the DNA and sequence it. Uh, it's kind of the keep it simple, stupid uh, kind of argument. But of course, if you're sitting in your armchair devising experiments, you can find reasons why they won't work. And one obvious reason was there may be so much human DNA in the samples that uh, you wouldn't get anything out of it. The other problem is, of course, post-mortem contamination with other bacteria which might swamp anything that you're looking for. But one of the uh, great advances in recent years has been that sequencing has become so cheap and so easy that you can do what, what Darwin used to call fool's experiments. You can do experiments that, if it doesn't work, you just don't tell anyone. But if it does work, you can, you can then let people know. And, you know so we, we did this fool's experiment. Let's just have a go. So what were the samples we were looking at? Well, they came from vats in Hungary. Uh, it's here in the middle of the country towards the north, uh, this town on the eastern banks of the uh, Danube. And in 1994, a crypt was discovered there containing uh, 242 bodies. Um, and the crypt uh, was apparently used for burials of the middle-class Catholic families and clerics uh, from this town uh, from the uh, early 18th century through to the early to mid-19th uh, century. Um, and here's the, the church there, the Dominican church, where this crypt was found. And for some reason, uh, many of these bodies were naturally mummified. I don't know if there's a, a clear explanation for that. Uh, um, atmospheric conditions or the, the material that was in the coffins or whatever. But anyway, in, in many cases, there was soft tissue in addition to the skeletal remains. And there was a, a backstory here as well, in that uh, Mark uh, and Helen and others had investigated 
this material over the uh, over the the, the, the uh, um, period since it was first found, in, uh, particularly around the turn of the millennium, shortly afterwards. Um, here is Mark actually sampling some of the material with a fiber optic endoscope, um, and so these previous studies gave us some degree of confidence that we might find something. Um, uh, they weren't actually able to grow tuberculosis from the sample, so that's quite reassuring because the risk assessments we'd had to do if, if there was any risk of that would have made it very hard to do any work. But uh, there was clear evidence that these uh, Hungarians actually had a high prevalence of tuberculosis, over 50%, maybe over 60% of the bodies gave molecular signatures uh, suggestive that they had tuberculosis. Um, so we were feeling kind of confident we might find something, but on the other hand, I was thinking we might get 10 reads that align with M tuberculosis or 100 reads. Um, and if we got something, as long as we got an unequivocal signal, I'd have been happy. So the first sample we looked at was from a lady uh, called Terezia Hausmann, who died um, on the day after Christmas uh, in 1797 at the age of 28. Um, and she, th these bodies were investigated in various ways. She, she actually had her chest x-ray done, which didn't show any obvious signs of tuberculosis, but she appeared to be cachectic, uh, wasted uh, uh, and diminutive in her body form, which was suggestive, consistent with the, a diagnosis of tuberculosis. And in her case, microbiological and molecular analysis on a sample from her chest had confirmed the diagnosis of TB and, and suggested that there was very good preservation of TB DNA. So here is uh, a picture of her mummified remains as they were found. Um, and here is the uh, death records um, in the local uh, parish register. Um, and this was one of the in interesting things about these samples is that they um, actually have historical dates associated with them. Um, so often when you're dealing with historical or ancient material, you haven't a clear idea uh, when it comes from precisely. So we just uh, slung it on the MySeq. Uh, one of my uh, postdocs did this as a little side project. Um, I said, go on, do it sometime uh, when, when you can fit it in among all your other projects. Uh, she used a method that Helen Donoghue provided to actually extract DNA, quite a laborious and slow method uh, to get DNA out of, of mycobacteria. And then she did the run, and, and then she came and told me about it. She got 5.5 million reads, which is pretty poor, actually, uh, by today's standards. And she said that less than 1% of them aligned against the human genome, so the human DNA obviously decayed away much more quickly uh, than the TB genome. Um, and 8% of the reads actually aligned against uh, the reference genome that people use when dealing with TB, H37RV, which provided a coverage, average coverage of 32x, which is just amazing. I just fell off my chair almost, because I, this is not far off what you'd get if you were just trying to sequence a, a con contemporaneous culture. Um, and I just said, I can't believe this. Um, it just doesn't make, it's just, is it, how can it be true? But we scratched our heads, and it was a, a bit like the, um, uh, the, the Sherlock Holmes phrase, that when you've excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, has to be the truth. And we hadn't cultured any TB. We'd not performed any PCRs in the, in the lab or anything like that. We'd not sequenced any TB genomes in the lab before. Um, and so we said, well, it must, must have originated from that sample, and it must be true. Um, and when we looked at the coverage plots, we did get... Uh, even coverage, pretty much, of the genome. So this is the whole genome laid out, sort of one to four, five million over here. And you can see we get generally a fairly consistent coverage of about 30-fold. There's a spike here, which I think is the ribosomal RNA operon, where you have uh, lots of conserved sequences together. Uh, and clearly there were other bacteria in the sample that were sufficiently similar to give that spike. But generally it was pretty even. Um, but there were some dropouts where you see nothing. There's one example here where you can see a, uh, a part of the H37RV genome that is not covered. And when we looked at that, we could say, oh, that is a particular indel, or de well, deletion, that's seen in, a, in this lineage, the, 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 the so-called Harlem lineage, um, when they're compared with H37RV. So the great thing about working with TB is that uh, the, it's a very... Um, 
straightforward organism. It, it, there's no recombination, there's no genetic exchange. Um, and over time, you get these deletions in l certain lineages which actually act as a signature. So it's very reassuring that we could actually even start to think about how we might genotype this particular um, uh, genome. But the uh, postdoc bioinformatician, Martin Sargent, who was doing the work, actually then started getting a bit stressy and, and saying he couldn't quite make sense because he could see some of these uh, deletions and that. He said, oh, it looks like it's in the Harlem lineage, but when he tried to draw phylogenetic trees based on SNPs and signal nucleotide polymorphisms, he wasn't getting a very consistent answer. And then he realized that the pipeline he was using was set so that if anything was less than 80% uh, covered in uh, the alignment, then it was excluded from his analysis. When he removed that constraint, he then suddenly started to see that, in fact, there were some SNPs that were present in 50%, roughly 50% of the reads, uh, um, and, and absent in the other 50% of the reads. And it became clear that we actually had two different uh, TB genotypes mixed together in this sample. Now, interestingly, some of the previous work had been done uh, with spologotyping on Theresia Hausman and, uh, and her mother, and I did identify uh, slight differences between the mother and daughter, two different genotypes in the same family. So, contextualizing it, it kind of uh, made some kind of sense. And, and, uh, it, it seemed when we first did it, though, a bit of a coincidence that the two genotypes were present in, in roughly 50-50 uh, ratios. But interestingly, when we were looked at the coverage plots in more detail in certain regions of the genome, so here you have a dropout where basically the coverage is running along here, 20 to 30, then it just drops to nothing. Okay, so that's present, that deletion is present in both strains when they're compared to the reference. But in other parts of the, the genome, the coverage drops to about half of what it was before. Um, and in this way, you can identify deletions in one of the strains, but not in the other strain um, uh, as we went through. So um, the long and short, that was that we wrote that up, actually. We were so amazed. We thought, right, we've got to get this out. And we wrote a letter. I phoned up the editor at the New England Journal I knew and said, do you want this as a short report? She said, no, we'll take a letter. So we wrote a letter just describing what we did and drew a simple kind of cladogram where we could say that there were certain deletions on this lineage here um, that occurred before these two mummy genotypes split off. There were some that separated the two mummy genotypes. And then uh, there was an outbreak in Germany uh, and this uh, recently, and this, this is a... a exemplar strain from that uh, outbreak, and we could see that they, they were closely related to that, but this outbreak had some additional deletions. So that was how we started, and then we decided to go further uh, in a sort of more extensive study, um, and we investigated eight bodies uh, from this collection in much more detail. Um, and what we found here is um, multiple genomes from several of them, from five of the eight bodies, we actually got more than one genotype, and we got varying coverage. Uh, amazingly, when we actually redid the analyses on the Tourette's Hausman sample, we were getting over 300x coverage. Um, and I really don't have any explanation as to why we're getting s we got such good results from these samples. One, one thought that does occur to me is that perhaps I mean, one explanation is that she had rampant TB and was just so full of the organism at death that that's what we're seeing, but the chest X-ray was relatively clear. Another option is that maybe the TB continued growing after death and the amount of biomass of the TB continued to grow, living off her, her dead lung. I don't know, but I, we're still amazed at these results here. One other uh, sample, we also got uh, over 100-fold coverage. For the others, we had to... Um, uh, make do with, with less good coverage, um, and uh, what we did was we actually started off by screening them as a, a 10 of them to a MySeq run, then when we saw something interesting we did a whole MySeq run, and then if we still thought we're not getting enough coverage, we did do one uh, high seek run where we actually ran them at much de uh, higher uh, depth of coverage to get to the, the required coverage. And when we looked at these genomes, all of them had a particular deletion in this gene, the PKS15-1 gene, which is characteristic of the Euro-American uh, lineage. So, um, we, w in a sense, that's not surprising. There is this Beijing lineage, which has traveled around the world in recent decades, 
uh, and is common in many places. But the Euro-American lineage was the, the kind of default uh, lineage in that part of the world at that time. So when we saw uh, multiple genotypes in, multi uh, in, in most of these bodies, um, we're again saying, what does this mean? Uh, is this real? Is real? Can it be real? Uh, and I initially I thought, well, there's something wrong here. But I looked at the literature, um, and there are uh, studies in the literature that say that in areas of high uh, prevalence, even today, in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, for example, there's a report where you get mixed infections in up to one in five cases. Um, there's been one report of four distinct genotypes from a single patient in, in contemporary microbiology. Um, and so it, it kind of does make sense. And probably it reflects a difference between what we're used to now, where TB in, in Europe is a fairly rare disease generally. A uh, person catches it on, in one episode, and that's that. Back then, if everyone had TB, or half of the people had TB, and they were coughing each, over each other all the time, then there was no reason to believe that there would just be one acquisition of TB. Maybe you were getting multiple acquisitions of the same strain and then of a different strain, uh, uh, and it kind of made sense. One point that actually is worth making, though, is that conventional TB microbiology is not particularly well suited to picking up mixed infections, so they're probably underreported at the moment. Um, and in fact, in response to our letter in the New England Journal, someone wrote in and said, yeah, it's very interesting you found this mixed infection. This is a problem that's, that's under-recognized. Um, and so it's interesting how we can highlight these deficiencies in modern approaches using ancient uh, DNA. So to then um, place uh, the, the various genotypes phylogenetically, we, were, uh, we, we thought, well, we, we don't have enough coverage of all of them to, to just draw a phylogenetic tree using trusted SNPs in the way that one usually does uh, in, in uh, genomic epidemiology of bacteria. So what we did instead was we, we got a large collection of isolates of genomes from the Euro-American lineage, this lineage four, um, and we drew a phylogenetic tree. We included four of our historical genomes that had high coverage in this, but the others um, we left out of the initial tree drawing, and then we were able to use a, an approach called phylogenetic placement, um, which is similar to, to what uh, Dan was saying yesterday about uh, genomic imputation, that you can even if you don't have perfect coverage of the genome, because this is a monomorphic organism, it just, um, there's no recombination, there's no horizontal gene transfer, even a single SNP can define a, a lineage. And so we were able to place our different genotypes on this gl global phylogeny of the, the lineage four. And in fact, what we did was we, uh, looked at each of the nodes in, in the phylogeny and we worked out what, what were the SNPs that defined that node and then we looked for evidence that those SNPs were present in the uh, genotypic information we had and here is a plot where you can see here we've got 100% of the SNPs that define that node, that node, that node, that node, that node and then as you get further down here you've got some of the things that define that node but not all of them. In other areas we've got say half of the SNPs there um, but this is an approach where you have imperfect information, but nonetheless you can, you can make uh, robust conclusions about the phylogeny of the strains that you're looking at. We also did a BEAST analysis, a uh, phylogenetic dating analysis. Um, uh, uh, German Zhao in um, Mark Uckman's group did this. We collaborated with them. Um, and he placed the, modern, uh, the most recent common ancestor of this lineage for in the late Roman period, about 450 CE. Um, now, that was interesting uh, in, in its own right, but it was also interesting in a slightly uh, troubling way in that it was consistent with the relatively recent origin of the MTB complex that Johannes Krauser and others had uh, posited uh, a, f a few months before in a paper in Nature. In fact, they borrowed some of our data to actually from the original New England Journal paper to come up with that. So it's not surprising that we found consistent results. But this led Helen Donahue to start spluttering with indignation because she said we have clear evidence of Neolithic samples that have TB 
and not just TB, but they have this TB1 de deletion, which means it's a modern TB, and so it, what you're saying can't be true. I didn't realise how much conflict there was in this field before I came into it. Maybe I wouldn't have come in if it had known how argumentative people in ancient DNA were, but I said, look, well, you know, I don't know. PCR does get contaminated sometimes, uh, and uh, maybe that's happened. But the other thing is, I have to admit that these beast analyses, they seem like a dark art. The people that run them, you know, they tune up and they have all these different models, and you, you kind of think, well, maybe they can come up with anything they like. Who knows? I mean, the other question is that there, is the, that there are assumptions. There's an assumption of, uh, of say, uh, a constant mutation rate. Um, and... Anyway, we're left at the moment with, whoa, what's, what's, where, where does the truth lie? And, and, and I perhaps uh, rather subversively say maybe we should get some genome level evidence from Neolithic samples uh, to settle this. And even if we had just 100 reads with some SNPs in from a Neolithic sample, that would probably take us a good way further forward. So that's been written up um, and came out a short while ago in, in Nature Communications, if you're interested to see further. I'm actually starting to run out of time. Um, so... We actually have taken this forward. We, we said, well, it's a bit odd that we can do this on 200-year-old samples, but nobody's done it on contemporary samples. So we went and did it on contemporary samples. Uh, here's my PhD student in, in the Gambia, uh, um, and uh, Emma Doughty, and we, we've written this up recently as well. Using the same kind of phylogenetic placement approach, we're able to place the genotypes from contemporary sputum samples on a phylogeny of TB strains. Uh, so we could detect the TB, but also characterize it. In the last few minutes, um, just one more example of, of where we can do this kind of thing with metagenomics. So we started uh, collaborating uh, with a, a lady called Raffaella Bianucci, who gave us some samples uh, from this medieval village of Gerudu in uh, Sardinia, uh, in the northern part of the island there. Um, so this village was abandoned in 1426. This is a reconstruction of what it might have looked like from the, from the air. Um, we were given material from this skeleton here, 2568, which was a 50 to 60 year old male buried in the second half of the 1300s and excavated in 1997. And here's the, the skeleton in situ. And in the pelvis here, there were all these funny looking calcified nodules. And we got given one of those. Well, we got given a couple of those to look at. Now, um, anyone, if, if you're medically qualified and you think, what, what kind of disease is going to give you calcification, you immediately think, well, it'll probably be TB. So we went in there doing the metagenomics thinking, well, we'll get some, maybe we'll get some TB genomes out of it. But um, interestingly, we didn't. Uh, we got brucella instead. So we got um, brucella DNA with a read length consistent, about 100 base pairs consistent with it being historical material, um, you know, much shorter than the average read length of all the stuff that was coming out in the, in the library that we were making. We got generally even coverage. Uh, in the initial study, we got 0.7-fold, and then we went 10-fold deep and got 7-fold coverage of this genome. Um, this is an uh, unusual bacterium. It's got two chromosomes, but we got even coverage of both of them. Again, you got the 16S, you know, for other conserved things. And we got signatures of DNA damage, suggesting that it was um, aged DNA. I never know whether you should use the term ancient DNA when you're talking about things from medieval periods or modern period. Um, anyway, we did uh, uh, phylogenetic placement again, and this time we were able to show that this brucella uh, fitted in with a, within the phylogeny of the brucella species and was clearly belonged with the brucella melatensis clade of, of, of sequences. Um, and then we were able to place it within, even more tightly within a clade um, within melatensis uh, alongside these other uh, four or five uh, sequences. And interesting, the majority of these sequences came from Italy in the global kind of uh, collection of, of sequences. So su suggesting that there had been uh, continuity, geographic continuity uh, of this particular genotype in that part of the, uh, of the world. We actually then went in and looked at uh, uh, confirmatory evidence from two other lines of evidence, uh, looking for deletions in the brucella genomes and seeing whether our particular clade, we call the ether clade, um, 
whether we could assign our genotype to that ether clade using these deletions. And there's an insertion sequence that jumps around, but fairly rarely. And we could, again, get evidence from, from that that this was actually uh, the right phylogenetic assignment. Interestingly, when we looked at the literature, there's a long evidence of brucellosis in Italy from paleopathology, uh, going back as far as Herculaneum. Um, we could only f there's only one ev other detection of brucella by ancient DNA studies, uh, and that was by PCR. Brucella melatensis is typically acquired from sheep and goats, um, and several people have said already that Sardinia is a kind of special place. Uh, it's, there's a long history of sheep and, and goat farming in Sardinia. Uh, and the sheep breeds there appear to be particularly uh, distinctive, and, and there's this Sardinian mouflon, which is, uh, I believe is, is closely related to the Neolithic um, ancestors that uh, were brought in. So it's kind of interesting uh, placing it in that context. Now, we don't know whether this guy um, was a farmer who actually came into contact with the animals directly or whether he was someone who ate dairy produce. Um, he had these changes in the skeleton which are associated with a sedentary lifestyle, so maybe that meant that he was just someone who ate the dairy produce, but we don't know for certain. So, in conclusion, um, we've used metagenomics and got 200-year-old TB genomes from Hungary. We found evidence of mixed infections. Or oh, one thing I forgot to say was that we actually, in Tourette's Hausman and her mother, we found the same two genotypes in both uh, samples, but in different ratios. Um, and so that's evidence that they either caught it from each other or the two of them caught it from a third source, but it's, a, it's kind of interesting to be able to gaze back in time and see these close links. Uh, we've got the brucella genome from Sardinia, and um, they illustrate the, the, the potential of metagenomics in this context and how you can do phylogenetic placement, um, and it's interesting that in both settings we're con confirming the continuity of these lineages uh, over ge in, in, in geographical continuity over uh, periods of time for several centuries. And that's me finished. Thank you, Mark. Any questions? Can I just a <coughs> comment? I sold my book yesterday. This guy wrote something called A Rough Guide to Evolution, <laughs> which is yeah. great. And anybody who hasn't seen it, he tells me. I haven't paid him to say this. But well, thank you very much for saying that. I, have, I should have brought some copies, I suppose, I, but I haven't. Yeah. So there are some other mycobacteria, um, quite, quite closely related to mycobacterium avium. Um, and in some of the other samples that we didn't follow up, they were predominant and it was uh, difficult to separate them out. What, you find, what we found when, when you first do your alignments under the default conditions, you sometimes get, it looks like there's something there. You look at the coverage plot though and it's very, very spiky. Um, and then and you can see that there are certain parts of the genome, the conserved parts of the genome have just got thousands of reads aligning to them. Um, um, so yeah, there are, there are the mycobacteria there. Um, I'm glad you asked him, not me. Yes, I mean, I can say that we were trying to get also material out of Atlet Yam with kind of similar approaches, to metagenomic approach as well as the capture approach that we usually use on TV. And I mean, I can just say what you just said yourself, that with kind of samples, especially that have to be buried in soil, you have a lot of microbacteria present. You have, in fact, hundreds and thousands of reeds that map to microbacteria, but to probably dozens and maybe even hundreds of species which we have a big problem if we do bacterial genomics because the reference databases are just like scratching on the surface of the diversity which is out there, maybe open 1% or something, have been sequenced probably even less, most of them you cannot culture. So it's very difficult to actually assign them to kind of species which you don't know about. But I mean, certainly it's not really clear if you, with this kind of approach, can then really exclude, for example, the presence of microbacterium tuberculosis in a sample when you have dozens or even hundreds of other species of microbacteria. And there was metagenomics, it's a problem, but even with the capture approach that we do. 
Um, what we could certainly say for those samples is we didn't have human DNA for the Neolithic samples that we have um, analyzed so far that had signs of TB. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have human DNA, you might not have the pathogen, but then I think also what Marx showed was that the human DNA often is not as well preserved as the microbacterial DNA. So we've also seen that, Ben also showed that on, on the leprosy samples, where microbacterial lepra is much better preserved than the human DNA in the same samples, which could be because the bacteria was still growing, which is one possibility, yeah. or the other possibility is just the human DNA degraded, because microbacteria have this thick cell wall and they're protected. So, it's, it's, it's really difficult. I think we don't have really conclusive evidence yet. But but the, I mean, the evidence from contemporaries, insofar as it goes, people have looked at outbreaks that are ongoing now, and the mutation rates that they come up with are more or less consistent with what we're saying, maybe one log, two different. Uh, so it's an interesting question. Um, and also, obviously, uh, the most recent common ancestor of the TB complex is not the same as the first organism that could cause TB-like lesions um, in, in, you know, mycobacteria other than tuberculosis can mimic tuberculosis. So. Um, and as you found with the pinnipedia, you know, sometimes surprising things are there. Uh, so. I think we have to keep an open mind. That's why it's exciting to be in the field. So, by the time we did the, the beast analysis, we'd actually got the, the, we took the four high coverage genotypes. And in the, in, in the ones that had the highest coverage, the, the mixture is really wasn't an issue. There was such a predominance of the TB. Uh, but basically they took out only the reads that aligned under stringent conditions with TB. So if you apply a stringent filter that says that, you know, it has to have no more than three base pair changes in every thousand or whatever, then you know, it, it, it's a way of, of doing that. Okay, thank you.